Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. I want to welcome everybody to My Horse University's web presentation series, and tonight we're featuring Matt Shane. Matt Shane is the County Extension Director for Michigan State University in Lenawee County. He is also the multi-county livestock educator for several southeast Michigan counties. Shane graduated from Michigan State University in 1994 with a bachelor's degree in animal science and with a master's of science degree in animal science in 1998. As a livestock educator, Shane works primarily with horse, beef, sheep producers. His primary subject areas are hay and pastures, manure management issues, and facilities. Many of the livestock owners in southeast Michigan desire a forage management system involving little or no chemical inputs. Shane has worked with many producers to develop sustainable forage management strategies. So let's go ahead and welcome Matt Shane tonight, and he will be presenting on hay selection. And I'm going to switch it over to Matt. We're also going to be, um, he will be taking questions during the presentation, just as a note. Um, but just limit your questions to the slides that are being shown. We will also take questions at the end for about 15 minutes. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, hope that you're all hearing me okay here. This is the first time that I've done one of these web presentations, and I'm sort of looking forward to it. So uh, as Kate said, if you have questions, feel free to uh, let me know those, and I'll take the ones that I can as we go, and the rest of them we'll uh, try and get covered at the end. Tonight's presentation is mainly focusing on hay management, and the d direction that I decided to take with this was for purchasing hay off the farm. We could spend a whole presentation on producing hay, uh, but decided that uh, most of the horse owners that I work with uh, on a regular basis are people that are buying hay from off farm and bringing it to their farm. So some of the things that we're going to look at this evening are uh, when purchasing hay, where should you buy it, when's the best time to buy, uh, how do you know what the quality looks like? How do you set a price? Looking at different availability uh, options, storage capacities, and what are some of the best ways to store hay? We're also going to cover how much hay uh, would you need, what kind of capacity do you have to have depending on the number of horses, how do you collect a hay sample to do a nutrient analysis to make sure that your horses are getting what they need, handling bales of different sizes and types, uh, some different feeding methods for ways to feed hay to horses, and there is a debate over uh, among a lot of areas in the horse industry on how we should be feeding hay to horses, and we'll talk about some of those. And also talk about wasted feed and what the cost and, and ways that we can manage that a little bit. And a, a problem that we have here in Michigan particularly is a new, not new weed, but it's a weed that's showing up a lot more these days called Horeolissum, and we'll spend just a few minutes talking about that. A couple things I wanted to cover on hay production, just as hay buyers, some things that you need to understand just starting off about uh, purchasing hay and in the process of making hay that makes it difficult sometimes to get hay that the producers are looking for. And one of the things that you need to know is that hay is a very weather dependent crop. And uh, Murphy's Law applies to hay production too. It's usually too, uh, too dry when the hay should be growing and it's too wet when it should be baled. And so that's one of the things that hay producers have to face is high humidity, um, drying days, weather versus maturity. And there's some issue over when do you harvest that first cutting of hay to make the subsequent cuttings uh, come into play and be of their optimal quality. And so you have to throw that, that into consideration as well. Uh, in some cases, we don't want the best quality hay. We want uh, optimum volume at the best uh, nutrient content that we can get. And when those two graphs cross, then we're happy with that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Typically, uh, we would expect uh, two to three cuttings a year in lower Michigan, and, and that happens usually about 40 to 60 days apart, starting sometime in uh, mid-May or early June, and ending up sometime typically in September. And when we harvest this hay, it's going to take two to four days to dry it. And so that is going to be dependent on the heat, uh, wind, as well as the humidity. And humidity it tends, tends to be a problem for us, especially midsummer and getting those later cuttings dried. 
terms of insects, uh, producers that are raising hay should be scouting fields on a regular basis and looking for insect damage because insect damage not only reduces yield, but it also uh, greatly can affect hay quality, especially uh, in the earlier cuttings. If you get a lot of leaf loss from insect damage, that can greatly affect protein quantities and those types of things, so you have to be aware of that. Uh, typically in first cutting, we see alfalfa weevils being the primary uh, pest of problem, and that uh, is a problem if there's alfalfa and other legumes in the plants. Potato leaf hoppers are a problem after first cutting. And again, these are primarily insects that affect alfalfa, uh, but a lot of our hays that are fed to horses that contain at least some alfalfa, and that's where a large portion of our protein comes from in feeding this hay. So now getting into how much, how much hay do you need for your horses, and there's some behavioral things that come into play with that. Uh, first of all, horses that that are, if they were just left to themselves and they had all the forage available that they wanted to eat and they could go out and graze, which is what they would like to do, have their head down between their feet uh, 18 to 22 hours a day chewing. And so that's something that you need to think about in terms of the way that we feed hay to horses when we change the way that we're delivering that hay and we're feeding them maybe two big meals a day. Uh, and, and not allowing them to eat over a longer period of time, that does affect digestibility and it diminishes the uh, availability of the quality of the material that we feed. So we can reduce the quality a little bit and offer more feed to those animals over a longer period of time, which will actually increase digestibility of that material. So in looking at how much hay is a horse going to eat over that 24-hour period, typically they're going to consume about 2 to 3 percent of their body weight a day in dry matter. So in terms of sourcing hay, I always use uh, the 2.5 to 3 percent range so that we're sure that we're going to have enough hay. It's better to have a few bales left over the next growing season than to run out when the weather's still bad and there's not hay available. Uh, typically, if you have a grazing season, if you have pasture available, um, in, our, in our area we look at about a 160 day growing season which starts sometime in, in early May and it goes until uh, usually about mid-October. So if we take a look at an example of how much hay we're going to go through, we make some assumptions of course. We have a thousand pound horse on average assuming that there's a forage only diet. If you're feeding grains or, or some other type of a supplement, you have to factor that into the nutrient content that that animal's going to be consuming a day. And so you want to make sure that you account for that. But assuming that we're feeding those animals on a forage only diet, and the animal is housed 12 hours a day during the grazing season, which would typically be a, a daylight hours turnout uh, in in the evening or, or vice versa. Some do it the other way, but assuming that they're stalled half the time and out half the time, that's approximately 160 day uh, turnout period. And during that grazing season, we'll also assume that 25% of the daily intake will be fed in the stall. Uh, that that would be hay that would be fed either morning and or in the evening, uh, making up about a quarter of what that animal would consume in a day. And again, this assumes that when they're outside that they have pasture available to them. If they don't, then hay should probably be fed outdoors as well. And then the remainder of the year, the other 205 days that we have left in our year, uh, when those animals are going to be not grazing because we're outside of our growing season, um, they're would be consuming a free choice hay diet, which means they're going to be eating that 2 to 3 percent of their body weight a day in hay. They have that available to them all the time. And we'll also make the assumption that the hay is put up at about 85 percent dry matter. This is fairly average, uh, around 15 percent moisture in that hay uh, as it sits in a barn is pretty typical of what we would see if we tested um, hay year round. So putting those numbers into some calculations, and here's we get into a little bit of math, but we'll work, we'll work through these bullet points one at a time. If you take a look at the uh, calculations here, a thousand pound horse uh, eating two and a half percent of its body weight a day in dry matter, that's 25 pounds per day of dry matter that would be consumed. Factoring the 85 percent dry matter into that equation, um, we come up with 28.75 uh, pounds of hay a day. Now again, during that 160 day period, looking at the next bullet point here, um, taking 25 percent of their daily intake in hay during that time frame times the 28.75 pounds of as fed hay a day times the 160 days gives us about 1150 pounds of hay consumed during that 160 day growing season. 
So then the next factor that we have to take into place is the 205 days when they're going to be eating harvested forage uh, exclusively. And so taking the 28.75 times the 205 days, uh, we come up with just under 6,000 pounds of hay consumed during those winter months. Add those two numbers together, we're just a little bit over 7,000 pounds of hay per horse per year. That's about three and a half tons. Assuming a 50 pound bale of hay, which is pretty average, um, that would be 140 bales per year. So now if your hay bales weigh differently than that, then you would obviously change that calculation. But the, the bottom line is we're feeding, uh, in this scenario anyway, we're feeding about three and a half tons of hay uh, per horse per year. So now taking that into consideration, uh, looking at storage capacity, assume that the uh, average small square bale of hay uh, is going to be, that 50 pound bale is going to be about five and a quarter cubic feet. So if we had an area that's 10 by 10 by 10, uh, that would be hold enough hay or 190 bales. So if the average horse is going to consume about 140 bales using our example. Um, we have capacity for 190 in a 10 by 10 by 10 area. So that gives you some idea of storage capacity if you have more horses and a longer feeder, feeding period, how much hay room you might just need to store that hay. Now if you're feeding round bales, a four by five, five foot round bale weighing six to eight hundred pounds is going to take up about a hundred cubic feet. And obviously if you're using round bales for hay, there's storage issues and other things that come into play, but also some additional handling equipment is going to be required for those larger bales. You can't pick them up and move them around like you can with a 50 pound small square bale. So then taking a look at if we're buying hay, I always recommend to producers that they try and purchase hay by the ton rather than paying by the bale. Now some hay uh, sellers are comfortable with by the ton and have access to scales and things like that, others cannot. Uh, but one of the things that I always recommend is that as a producer that you at least take the time to weigh a few bales and try and get an average weight of the bale even if you are purchasing by the bale. And if you look at the example that I have here with the difference between a 30 pound bale and a 50 pound bale at approximately the same price, $2.03 versus $2 a bale, uh, the difference is $135 a ton versus $80 a ton. Now remember that horse is going to eat three and a half tons of hay a year in the scenario that we had and they don't care whether it's a 30 pound or a 50 pound bale. So at that same price as a horse owner you need to be aware of roughly how many tons of hay that you're buying. So you can do that simply by weighing a few average bales. Um, even if you bring your bathroom scale with you, pick up a bale and stand on it and see what the difference in weight is to come up with a rough estimate so that you know if you, are you getting the value for your money or not. Uh, typically you can find an advertised price for hay in your area on a ton basis and you can compare that to what you're paying um, by the bale or by the ton uh, with the hay that you're purchasing. You also want to make sure that you examine several, several bales of hay prior to purchase and this is true regardless of whether you're buying your hay at an auction market or at a, directly off of a farm uh, or maybe even right out of the field. Um, and, so, and so one of the things that we have to look at is making sure that you analyze several bales because if you get a lot of light bales initially in a load and then heavy ones or the quality can vary greatly throughout a load so you want to examine that that hay. Um, and I've gotten a couple of questions here on on uh, hay prices and yes this year uh, the two dollar a bale people are dreaming for that uh, in, our, in our area and around the country uh, hay prices have really gone up and there's a lot of factors involved in that. Dry weather has a lot to do with it. Um, the two dollars is just an example but um, there, there are, a, there is a wide variety in prices right now in hay. Um, I, I still see some hay advertised in our area in the two to two and a half to four dollar range, but some of that probably isn't the better quality hay. But I have heard for hay going up nine, ten dollars a bale, and certainly in some of the southern states, it's up a whole lot, whole lot higher than that. And you can see some of the prices up here, thirteen, sixteen um, dollars a bale. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about hay quality as we go through here um, a little bit further in terms of selecting some hay. So we'll um, get back to purchasing here and looking at 
Um, buying hay as a horse owner, it's important to not necessarily go to a, a hay seller and say, I'm looking for horse hay. Uh, as in, most of you know that own horses, one of the things that you find that if you put the word horse in front of it, there tends to be a higher price associated with that than if you're talking about something else. And in terms of hay, hay is hay. You need, the, you need good quality hay for your horses, uh, but there really is no such thing as horse hay. You just need high quality hay, and the quality is going to depend on the type of horses that you have. Um, generally horses at maintenance uh, that don't get a lot of heavy workouts during a week are just a good quality grass hay uh, which can be sometimes difficult to find depending on where you live uh, may be difficult so you're just looking for a good quality hay and we'll talk about determining quality a little bit more in just a little bit um, the other thing, if you can do it, if it works out and you have the availability in your area to find all the hay from one source, that's typically a good way to go. Because if you can source it from one one owner or one farm or one area, then you pretty much can determine what your quality is going to be when the hay is harvested is going to be at the same time. Um, you can work with that. So trying to find from one source is always a good idea. Also makes a difference in determining quality. If you're really trying to get at what's the nutrient value of the hay that you have, you don't have to run a lot of different hay samples. If you're buying from one source, you could just sam sample each cutting, for example, instead of having to sample numerous um, sources if you're getting hay from a lot of different places. One of the things in trying to keep costs down and looking at buying hay is if you can get the hay during the growing season when that hay is being harvested, you certainly have storage issues with that. If you, if you don't have the capacity to do, store that hay, uh, again looking at the volumes that we talked about earlier, it is important to um, keep in mind that you want to try and figure out what you're going to use, especially if you have a, a winter where you are where there isn't going to be hay available. Um, trying to buy it during the growing season is certainly one way to keep the cost down. And one way that um, some producers work through that is if they don't have the storage themselves is you could pay a nominal fee to a lot of hay, hay sellers that do have storage capacity for hay. Many of them will store it for a small fee and that fee tends to be less than what you would have to pay if you were trying to buy hay that hadn't been purchased previously. But if you can lock in your price early, uh, maybe pay in advance and then pay a storage fee on that hay in somebody else's barn and pick it up as you need it, that's certainly one way that you can keep costs down there if you can find producers that make that option available to you. Typically, after we hit the first of the year, uh, those hay producers that have been holding on to hay stores start to um, flood the market with that hay. Um, and so initially the hay prices really go up and they drop for a little bit as the market gets flooded, but then usually right around the first of the year is when we start to see those prices start to um, jump up because uh, we, the supply starts to go down. And so the hay supply gets tighter, obviously supply and demand would indicate that our price would begin to increase. And so trying to get your hay in uh, before that period of time is always a good way to do it if you can. One of the things that you may do as a horse owner would be to consider uh, purchasing, some, uh, purchasing some old crop hay for summer feeding because the hay quality, if you have pasture available to you and you're just feeding during some stalling times, you certainly don't need a as high a quality of feed as you would during the winter months. And so buying some of that old crop or last year's hay, which would tend to be uh, have a decreased vitamin content, certainly would still have some protein and energy values. And so you can use that hay to get you through the growing season and often pick that up at a less expensive price as long as um, as long as you can and put that hay in um, and get it used up before you go into the next the next winter months. Uh, one of the questions uh, that came up here is about the storage of fresh hay, and that we'll get to the feeding of fresh hay too. One of the things, if you're buying hay right out of the field, uh, hay goes through a fermentation and curing process, and so once that hay is put in a stack. Uh, it needs to stay there for at least two weeks. Uh, three to four weeks would be better. A lot of times if hay supplies are tight and you can't get it, um, you can't get it that fast. Well, I got some calls this summer from producers that were concerned that were hauling hay down south uh, that some of the hay was moldy when it got there. And that is because when you have a, an oxygen-free environment when that hay is a stack and you start moving that stack around, 
um, you're putting oxygen where there wasn't previously ox oxygen available and it disrupts the fermentation process and you can actually get mold to develop in haze that wouldn't have normally molded if they were allowed to cure. So that hay needs to sit for at least two weeks before you start uh, feeding it and or moving it around. So once it's gone into a stack, it should sit for a while. And if you do that, then once it's cured, then you can move it around freely and stack it and move it and you're not, you're not going to have the risk of uh, mold developing and those other types of issues that you worry about with handling fresh hay. So how do we determine uh, quality on hay? There's some visual factors that we can that we can work through, but the the only true way that you can determine what's the value of that hay to your horse nutritionally is to have a forage test done. Uh, forage tests are relatively inexpensive when you take into account the the cost of your hay, and if you can determine that the hay is a little better quality that you than what you thought, and you can buy some lesser quality hay to blend with it that might be a little bit less expensive. Those are some ways that you can keep costs down, but you don't know that unless you've actually done a forage test. And I recommend that those, that hay is tested uh, for each cutting. Um, because there's going to be obviously a, a nutrient difference between cuttings and so you'd want to test that and if you're getting it from multiple sources then each batch of that hay should be tested as well. Um, and that's what makes it difficult if you're looking at buying hay from several different farms in the area or it's being trucked in from different places and you're buying lot loads at an auction, uh, you're probably not going to be able to turn around uh, forage tests quickly enough to have them be of much value to you. So again, trying to source large lots at one time gives you the advantage of being able to use that information for, for nutrient testing. Uh, here's some pictures of what the hay testing equipment looks like that uh, that is available. There's a lot of different types and styles. I just picked a couple here for this presentation. This uh, Penn State forage sampler attaches to it a handheld or an electric drill and it takes a core sample of the bale. Most labs that do forage testing uh, prefer uh, core samples because you get a more representative sample of different bales versus grabbing a handful of hay out of a bale. They can certainly grind that sample and get a representative sample out of that, but if you're taking a handful, it doesn't take very many handfuls to fill a bag, and so you're not representing as many bales in that sample. And typically we like to see um, you know, 15 or 20 bales sampled uh, for every couple hundred or so bales that are put in the barn, um, and that gives us a pretty good representation, mix that all together, and then send that sample in. There's also moisture meters available. A lot of producers that are baling hay have moisture testers available if they're not quite sure uh, how, how well the hay is drying or if it's dry enough to be baled. You can use a moisture tester for that. You may also want one as a producer if you're, as a consumer, if you're buying hay. Uh, may feel a little damp to you. You can use a mo moisture tester to make sure that you're uh, getting the hay dry enough. Typically with small square baled hay, uh, we like to see moisture at no more than about 17%. If it gets much above 17%, we have an increased risk of uh, mold and also uh, barn combustion issues. If that hay gets hot enough, it can, can heat up enough to uh, start to smolder and start a fire. So we want to keep that hay um, you know, under 17% if possible. And actually there's a myth out there that if you're brown baling hay, that round baled hay can handle a little bit more moisture and still and still keep, and that's actually not true. Round baled hay um, should be even a little bit drier to maintain its quality than what we would put small square bales in the barn, and that has to do a lot with the way that hay is stacked and stored um, and how we handle it as to why that hay doesn't keep quite as well. And certainly there's hay that's been put up a lot more than 17% that has turned out okay, but you do run a risk when you get that. So trying to keep that hay somewhere between 14 and, and 15, 16% is really ideal in terms of putting up a good quality hay into the barn. So for collecting uh, hay samples, again, uh, cores are preferred. Uh, 10 to 20 bales should be sampled, and that'll depend on how your lot size and what you have, but that gives us a pretty good representative sample. Uh, if you're not going to use the information, if you're not going to actually compare that to um, a nutritional plan for your animals, then maybe testing doesn't mean anything to you. If you're, if you're not going to utilize the information, don't spend the money on the test, but if you're just curious as to what protein level you're at or what energy level at you're at, that's fine but I would encourage you to use that, um, use that information if you have it. Uh, and again, each cutting should be sampled because 
Uh, you know, there's some places where we're getting four, five, six cuttings, but uh, here in Michigan we typically get no more than three. But just because third cutting tends to be more nutrient dense doesn't mean that that's the best quality hay uh, that is available because uh, the way that that hay is handled, the way that it's harvested, if it gets too dry and the leaves come off, you can certainly get, um, you can certainly reduce quality by, um, by the way that that hay is baled. So you can't always assume that one is better than um, the other, that the later cutting is better than an earlier cutting. So hay sampling is the only way that you can determine that. So if you're looking at hay and trying to determine uh, what, what type of hay should I be looking at, what some visual factors that I can take into account to make sure that I'm getting the best hay for my horses, uh, typically we start with color. Uh, color is not the only factor, but it is a very good factor that we can use to determine hay quality. Hay that's very bleached out, um, meaning it's more in yellow in color than it is green, it was exposed to a lot more sunlight over a longer period of time, uh, means that that hay may have lost some of its nutrients during the drying process. Sometimes that can indicate that, for example, hay that's been rained on uh, prior to baling and that has to get re-dried out again, it may not have dust, it may not have mold, it may have dried down just fine, uh, but it bleaches out some of the color. It looks more like straw than it does hay in some cases, and that's a factor that we can use to determine quality. Now, just because hay is a little bit yellowed, maybe some of that grassier first cutting hay does tend to have a little bit more of a brownish yellow color to it. That may be just the type of hay that you need uh, for some good winter uh, fill type hay to blend with maybe some better hay, but color is not the only factor. The other thing to keep in mind when we look at hay quality is there's no such thing as completely dust free or completely mold free. You try and minimize the amount of dust and mold and certainly mold is more of a concern, but just inherent in the baling process and driving tractors across the field, running the hay rake, some dirt is going to be stirred up because it's dry when we're typically baling this hay, there's not moisture there. And so we do stir a little bit of dust and dirt up and that's going to get into that hay, so there's going to be some dust. But you don't want an excessive amount of dust and that's hard to define uh, not having a visual aid to be able to do that with. but. You just want to use common sense. If there's a little bit of dust, that's okay. If you open up the bale and dust comes pouring out, then, then obviously there's too much dust. Same goes for mold. There shouldn't be any noticeable mold odor. You don't want to see hay that's clumped together uh, with white or black that indicates a high level of mold. Uh, but to find a couple of moldy spots in a bale from time to time is pretty typical. Uh, that You get to the end of a row when you're baling hay, that material's been driven over, or maybe when you turn around with a hay rake, it gets bunched up a little bit, there's some moisture, you're going to find mold from time to time. And if you do have some level of mold, just take that hay and throw it out. Uh, don't feed it to the horses, and it, but there shouldn't be bales full of mold. That's basically the rule of thumb that you want to live by there. Stage of maturity um, is another thing visually that you can determine. You can look for alfalfa plants and see if you see any little purple flowers. Um, that's an indication that that hay is, is at full bloom. If you see a lot of purple flowers and there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, the stemmier the hay is, the more waste that you tend to get, so stage of maturity is important. Looking at the amount of leaf, um, if there's a lot of stems and not a lot of leaves to go with them, if you're dealing with a legume type hay, uh, that's an indication that quality may be decreased. Um, color again is important. Odor, you want to put your nose in those bales of hay and see what they smell like. They should smell, um, you know, fresh, not have a, a dusty or moldy odor to them. Uh, and so that's, that's something that's important. Is the hay tough versus soft? And again, that's sort of hard to define, but if it's very stemmy and scratchy and, and um, versus a lot of soft grasses in it, that may impact the way that the horses eat it. And it depends on what your horses are used to, but there are some differences in how that hay handles and how it feels. And then how much foreign material is there? Is there a lot of sticks and leaves? Is it baled along a woodlot or something where we have a lot of deciduous leaves mixed in with that material? Uh, maybe there's some bales that have a high a amount of weeds in them. Uh, you know, those types of things are, you can certainly determine quality by how much foreign material is mixed in with those bales. And again, that goes to uh, examining several bales prior, prior to purchase. And so getting back at the determining price aspect of baling hay or buying hay, uh, get an average bale weight uh, even if you're purchasing hay by the bale. 
you want to try and get an average bail weight. Um, also consider the possibility of storage, you know, can you store it on farm or can you hire storage or find an empty barn someplace uh, to put, to store some hay in so that you can lock in that price. Um, also consider time of year. Hay price, obviously if there's a drought, hay price is going to be very high. Uh, and then as we get into winter when, when there isn't any more hay being made, that price is going to continue to go up. So trying to purchase hay in the non-growing season months is going to be much more difficult than purchasing it during the growing season. And some things, if you're, if you're a smaller scale producer and you're buying little bits of hay, uh, those types of things, sometimes you want to consider some of the extras in determining price. You, look, you lock in that ton price, but then there may be some other factors that come into play. There may be some extras. There may be delivery. Uh, if your hay is delivered to you on site, maybe it's even delivered and stacked in the barn. Uh, those are some things that you want to producers shouldn't have to do those things for free. And so when you get a, if you feel that you get a reasonable price for the hay itself, then you might want to uh, consider uh, increasing that price a little bit to get some of these extra services that may come along with that. Another extra that may be involved would be guarantees. Uh, the advantage of working with uh, directly with a farm owner that's bailing hay is you might have the opportunity to go back if the hay quality isn't quite what you want it to be or where you think it should be. You can then uh, go back and say, this is what, not what we wanted. I've been a customer for a long time. Can we work something out that's going to make this um, hay fit a little bit more what I need and, and exchange some bales or whatever needs to be done. And a lot of times if you have a relationship, you can do that. Uh, but those producers that work under those agreements often uh, get a little bit of a premium uh, for, your, for their hay because they're offering that service as part of it. So just keep those things in, in mind as well. A couple places that you may consider buying hay, one is at an auction yard, and again, um, auctions are always buyer beware regardless of whether you're buying livestock or, or hay or, or farm equipment or anything else at an auction. It's always up to the buyer to determine um, determine what, what there is that they're buying. And so, you know, we've had some instances and some hay auctions around that I've, that I've witnessed where the good quality hay is on the outside of the stack, and as we get into the middle, we get some uh, hay that's not represented as it should be. That doesn't happen very often, uh, fortunately, but it does happen from time to time. Most of the time, um, a hay that's in the stack is pretty uniform throughout, but you certainly want to wanna look at the quality of the hay uh, throughout that stack, survey several bales within the stack, even if you have to move them around a little bit, that's usually acceptable. Uh, depending on the hay market. You also want to get there early and take a look at the hay, study it, don't run up as they're bidding and buy something that you're not sure what you're getting. So uh, that's important. You also want to set a price limit in your head before you get there and try and stick to it. This goes for basically any auction buying, but uh, when you're bidding against other people that want the same thing that you want, sometimes you tend to not pay as much attention to the what you're doing instead of the competition and you might end up paying more than what you wanted to. So find that price and stick with it. Just remember that in auction, hay quality is highly variable, or can be, so you need to make sure you do your homework. And the other problem with buying hay from auctions is it's hard to determine, hard to get a consistent supply. Um, sometimes you get, um, you know, you're going to have different producers there each week as one runs out of supply, a new producer may show up to fill that spot, and so it's hard to get consistent quality hay, and that's changed, modifying your horse's diet slightly if you can't keep that consistent, and so that um, can lead to some issues too, so you want to try and keep it as consistent as possible. If you're buying it from another farm, um, then you have the ability to establish a relationship. You have the possibility of that guarantee or re some returns coming into place. You have the ability to negotiate. Uh, maybe it's quantity, maybe there's some storage, there's some things that you can negotiate. The difficulty of that is it's subject to availability. When a producer runs out of hay, they run out of hay. So if you get to them too far down the list, you may not um, have the, the hay available that you need and then you're forced to go to another place. Um, to get hay that may end up being an auction to fill some of that gap, but it is it is nice to have um, you know to have a relationship with somebody that you can work with on a consistent basis anytime that you're buying feed for livestock. 
So in terms of availability, as many of you know uh, very well, weather is going to have a big impact on how much hay is available. So as, the, as a hay purchaser, you need to keep in mind what's going on with the environment just as the hay grower does and pay attention to what's happening with the weather and during the growing season to know is hay going to be short this year, is there going to be plenty, and how, how far can I afford to wait before we're going to have a problem where I might not have enough hay to feed my horses. Um, and it's going to vary you know, quality and availability is going to vary greatly around the state and country, so depending on where you get your hay from, you need to be cognizant of that. Uh, when hay is in good supply, you may consider putting on some extra. Again, remember, you could keep some of that hay around another year and feed it as summer feed the next year if you need to. So if you have the capacity and availability to do it, you may put some other in. You never know when we're going to have a, a serious drought year, as we have in some parts of the country now, uh, and there isn't going to be hay. So if you have the ability to put extra hay in the bar, barn, even if the quality isn't there, you can always supplement with grain or some other supplements, um, but to be able to to keep that horse's digestive system working. They need that fiber, they need that roughage. So even if it's two-year-old, three-year-old hay, if it's been stored properly, um, you just would need some extra supplementation, but you can certainly use it to meet the horse's fiber needs. Um, so don't be afraid to put in extra hay. You just want to rotate that out as you put new in and try not keep it around for years and years, but use it when you need it. Um, and consider extra storage capacity. Is it, is it feasible to put up a, a temporary structure or some other type of thing to have some additional storage to help keep costs down longer term? If you're in the horse business for um, you know, the long term, having, having that storage capacity on your farm may be beneficial to you to keep those costs down. Uh, you might not realize those savings right away, but you could certainly um, realize them long term. Big bales, I get a lot of questions as an extension uh, educator about feeding big bales to horses and, and again I mentioned the difficulty in, in harvesting that hay that it really does need to be dry. Uh, there's certainly some handling and storage issues that you need. It's nice to be able to take those slices off of a small square bale and feed it to the horses by hand. If you're feeding round bales or big square bales you've got some handling um, issues there but that there's it's the same hay as long as it was handled well and appropriately, there's no reason that you can't feed that hay to horses. Uh, individual horses is a, is a little bit of a difficulty, but it can be done. Um, quality can be an issue. You have to not just assume that it was handled properly and appropriately because, as I mentioned, a lot of producers will, with the rains coming, the hay's a little damp, might get out the round baler, so you want to make sure that you assess the quality before you purchase. Um, and really that round bale hay needs to be stored just like square bale hay. It should be stored inside or very well covered immediately after harvest and not sitting outside just because it's, it's round bale hay um, because we can have a lot of waste uh, with that if it's not handled pro appropriately. So, you know, waste is a concern with the big bales. If you're feeding, especially if you're feeding them outside to a group of horses, for example, um, a 900 pound round bale is going to take seven horses about four days to eat. And if hay sits out much more than three or four days, you're going to start to suffer some quality losses uh, unless you're in a very dry and, um, you know, we're not getting a lot of rain, uh, those types of things. Weather exposure to that hay, um, typically you want to use that hay up certainly within a week. And if you don't have the number of horses available to do that, then, then round bales may not work in a group setting. You might want to consider unwrapping by hand or doing something like that into feeders and feeding it on more of a limited basis. So I like, I like this slide, it doesn't have anything to do with horses, it has to do with sheep, but it gets to the idea of hay waste. And if you have bales that are stored, that are stored outside, uncovered, um, as these ones obviously were here, uh, you want to keep in mind that 30% of the hay in a 5 foot diameter bale is, how, is held in the outer 6 inches. And so clearly by this picture there's more than 6 inches of hay in that bale, so we're wasting more than 30% of the hay, not to mention the hay that you see there scattered around on the ground, and horses can just as easily do that as the sheep can. So, so you want to keep that in mind that, that if you're using larger bales of hay or even small square bales of hay, the storage is important and the, it needs to keep quality in mind so that you're not losing quality by the way that we're storing this hay and, and creating a lot of waste which is just going to add to your feed bill annually. So if you're feeding uh, hay free choice to horses, which means they just have hay available to them all the time, 
then you're going to need an, to take additional factors into how much hay you're going to need, 10 to 50 percent more, depending on your feeding method. Um, covered feeders are going to reduce waste if you don't have weather damage and things like that, or feeding inside in a lean-to or run-in, those types of things. Um, if you limit feed plus about 5 to 10 percent, you can reduce some of that waste. So if you figure out uh, roughly what your horses are going to need a day uh, by weight and use that two to you know two and a half percent body weight a day, add five to ten percent of that instead of just having hay out there all the time, you can reduce your waste a little bit. So typically, if you use three three to three and a half percent of their body weight as fed uh, to determine limit feeding, and then add a little bit to that, you can again using our example of a thousand pound horse, that animal is going to need to be presented with thirty to thirty five pounds of hay a day to meet their uh, total nutrient intake needs. There's a lot of debate over how we feed hay. Uh, should hay be fed outside or inside? And you know, outside feeding is preferred. Where we're out in the fresh air, the wind's blowing, keep some of the, if there is dust or a little bit of you know the particles in the hay as it breaks down, uh, blowing away those kinds of things. Um, maybe in a run-in or something like that, but not in a stall necessarily. But you can feed hay in stalls too. And then the the great debate is: Do we feed horses on the ground? or do we feed them up in the air in a hay feeder? Um, gravity would indicate that if you feed them on the ground where their head is down, that it's harder for the dust and other particles and molds and things to get into the animal's lungs and potentially cause problems. But if we're feeding on the ground, then you have the potential risk of sand colic if they're eating directly off the ground. So using mats or tires or something that you can contain that hay in so the animals aren't picking it up right out of the dirt, but yet have access to it um, all the time where their head's not up in the air, uh, that may be the best way to go. But there is still a lot of debate. There's a lot of science and research being done on the proper way to feed horses hay. Um, but nature would typically dictate if they're out grazing, they have their head down between their feet. So uh, my personal opinion uh, is that animals ought to be fed down on the ground rather than up in hay feeders, but keeping in mind the sand colic type issues and coming into play with that. You also want to keep in mind horse safety and ease of use with whatever types of feeders or ways that you're providing that, um, providing it down, you know, the hay to the horses. Uh, some One neat idea I saw at a farm I was at one time was that a person um, got some old uh, runner type carpets that you use in entranceways to buildings that are heavy rubber carpet when they get worn down a lot of those companies just throw those out or try and recycle them in some way you can get them for really um, really inexpensively flip those over rubber side up throw the hay on top of it out there um, there might still be a little dirt around but you're going to really limit that and it's really kind of a safe thing for the horses to be around as long as you don't have horses that like to pick them up and drag them around the field all the time so here's some different types of feeders, and again, these would be up in the air options. The round bale feeder, obviously, the horse could get its head down, but uh, different different things that you can use to feed horses in. Uh, there's the standard stall racks. Again, horse has its head up in the air when it's eating, so you have to you know you have to weigh that. But they are those are feeders that are available um, to be used in stalls or run-ins. Now, looking at hay storage, hay should be um, hay should be stored inside whenever possible, kept out of the weather. Uh, there's some sunlight exposure on this hay stored in this open-ended hoop building, as you can see, but it is off up on, off the ground. There's pallets down there on the bottom. You may still get some molding uh, happening there in that bottom layer, so you'd want to check it. But at least this hay is in direct exposure to rain. The outer bales will get a little sun bleaching, might lose a little vitamins there, but the inner bales should still store uh, pretty well there. The one thing I would say about this particular haystack is it's stacked a little bit close to the roof of the building. If you look over on the left side of the picture, there's not a lot of airflow around the, the left-hand side of that stack. So that might be something to consider, leave a little bit more of air space around there to keep air flowing evenly around the bales. And try and keep hay off the ground uh, whenever possible. Even in a cement floor barn, if you put it right on the ground in there, you will get some molding as that cement um, has moisture cond um, condensing through it, uh, especially in the winter months. So you want to make sure that you keep, get it off the ground where you can get some airflow underneath it to help prevent mold from occurring.
If you look at these two pictures here, you can see the difference between some hay that's stored completely inside versus hay that's stored in, a, in an open-sided building. Now the hay interior to those bales is probably fine, but you're going to have more waste in the picture on the right, and that's just something to keep, into, uh, keep in mind as you, as you handle hay that way. Um, inexpensive versus high quality covers. If you're storing hay outside, if you need to store some hay outside, using the cheap black plastic may sound like a good idea at the time, but you'll notice in the picture on the left, there's a lot more waste with that. You're going to lose a lot more hay. There's some moisture going to get down in between those bales. Um, even if you're not in a freezing and thawing environment, the moisture and rainfall that gets in there is going to cause some damage to that hay versus the picture on the right where it's well covered stacks. Um, the only thing I would say there is the stacks are close enough together that you can could get some water pooling in between those bottom bales on the bottom and it doesn't look like those are off the ground at all but certainly they're covered a lot better so your waste would be uh, significantly less there. Horealism, uh, just wanted to mention it briefly. We could talk a lot about different plants uh, and things that could cause problems for horses around the state and country and and you know, every area of, this, of the country is a little bit different in what plants we're concerned with, what insects we're concerned with. Um, but this is one, when I talk to Michigan producers, that I want them to be aware of. There's a lot of um, good information out there on horealism and what it looks like and where you can find it. There's some other weeds that are, look similar to it that are often confused with it, but if you look for that white flower, translucent teardrop-shaped seed pod, um, that, and we usually see it in later cuttings of hay. We don't see it much in first cutting. It's typically found in second or third cutting. Um, but it is a short-lived perennial. Uh, or an annual a lot of, in some areas, depending on how you know much damage was done to it when it was harvested. Generally, we see it in sand or, sandier quality soils, poorer quality soils, um, so, edges of the field that don't get maybe as fertilized as well. Those kinds of things is where this tends to show up. Um, overgrazed areas if it's in a pasture situation as well. On hay fields that haven't been maintained properly or getting old, those types of things, we tend to see horealism creeping into those. It's mainly only a problem in high concentrations when we get 30 to 70 percent um, of the bale made up of this, but I, w I have been working with some farms lately that have seen some of the symptoms of horealism toxicity and we're only finding just a few uh, plants here and there. It certainly wouldn't be at the 30 to 70 percent. We haven't been able to pinpoint any other cause and it's certainly exhibiting some of the symptoms of horealism toxicity and we have found limited quantities of it. So that would lead us to believe that potentially that's a that is an issue that could have caused it. So um, science is still out on exactly how much causes the problem, but general rule of thinking is it is quite a bit, so it would be easy to spot if you're finding it in the hay. And that goes back to that looking for foreign material in the hay as you see it. But the clinical signs that we're mainly looking at is fever, colic, bloody diarrhea, laminitis, anorexia, dehydration, um, early parturition in mares, so you have to be really careful with it with breeding stock. Um, now, one of the things that that we, you know, have I've seen a lot of this summer more than others, and I think because some hay, especially from Michigan and the Midwest, is being shipped around other parts of the state, is there's a big concern about horealism. Um, and I would say, just from my experience in working with hay producers, um, that Horealism isn't a widespread problem. It's just something to be aware of that we don't want to see it become a problem. So helping uh, livestock and horse owners keep hay producers aware that it is an issue that they need to be monitoring for in, the, in those fields. But I don't think that there's any widespread epidemic of horealism and hay being shipped around the country and causing problems with horses. Um, but because there has been discussion about it, I think the word is spread around that Michigan hay in particular or other states in the Midwest are, have this problem and I would say that that's not necessarily true but again it's just something that you want to be aware of just like if you live in states where blister beetle is a problem um, you certainly need to be aware of it although it is often controlled in those areas because those producers are aware of the issue and do everything that they can to keep that out of the hay. Um, now there is a there is a question here about fescue 
Um, and fescues can be a problem. We're looking at making sure that varieties that are out there that are being utilized for hay are the endophyte free um, varieties so that we don't have to worry about um, we don't have to worry about the endophyte problem causing um, some issues, especially in breeding stock uh, with those pregnant mares. So you want to just keep that in mind too. If you if there is a lot of fescue and hay in your area, you want to make sure you're asking if it's an endophyte-free variety. And with that, I think that wraps up my presentation. I'd be happy to entertain a few questions if any of you have any more. Okay, there's a lot of questions. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions about the non-structural carbohydrates, and, and I'm by no means an expert on this topic, and can certainly uh, you know direct you to some areas where you could get some more um, information about it. But one of the things that we um, you know that we have run into here in Michigan, working with horse owners and some of the folks that I work with on campus that are a lot more knowledgeable about this topic, and, and I have talked about this quite a bit, and in that if we really look at the way if the diets that we're providing with horses and trying to keep horses within their target weight um, that the carbohydrate content of our hay becomes a lot less of an issue um, yeah, we tend to in Michigan anyway uh, and probably would have guessed it's true in a lot of other states as well that we tend to overfeed grain to horses that simply don't need it if we're feeding a good quality hay to most horses uh, that are you know, not under heavy work and, and a half an hour workout a couple times a week is hardly heavy work and so a lot of times we're looking at uh, the issue of um, you know horses that have been overfed grain and so that changes their metabolism and then you start to look at some of these carbohydrate issues. Um, typically the hay content isn't as much to worry about. Uh, certainly if it becomes an issue and you have a horse that's under that circumstance, you obviously would want to adjust the grain that you're feeding. Um, but then also you look at ways that you can find hay. You can start to then look at the testing for the non-structural carbohydrates and some of those kinds of things. But uh, it's one of those areas that it's gotten a lot of press. Um, I don't think that hay is the issue. If you have a horse that really has a problem, then what you try to do is limit intake rather than trying to totally change the type of feed that you're feeding to those horses. Um, and so that's I certainly could, we could spend more time on that, but I think that's enough about it right now. If you have questions, I'd certainly be happy to have you email them to me and we can address it, uh, address it further. Um, question here about the difference between uh, Timothy and Fescue, and it's just simply, um, the difference is that they're two different species of grasses. Uh, in terms of in terms of quality, uh, palatability, those types of things, there's not a lot of difference in terms of nutrient content and those types of things. Timothy has often been billed as the horse grass and you know horses do like the Timothy. The problem with Timothy if you're trying to run it in a, a mixed hay is that Timothy tends to um, mature earlier than some of the grasses and we can run into some palatability issues. The same would be true with fescue in that case as well, I guess. Um, but there's not a there's not a huge difference between Timothy and fescue in terms of um, its growth stages or quality factors, those kinds of things. They're 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 basically uh, very similar in terms of nutrient content. Uh, let's see here. A question on uh, pellets. Uh, grass or alfalfa pellets and people are using them. Uh, there are there are a lot of pellets out there, uh, forage based pellets and and those are fine. Uh, a lot of times you have to worry about a um, couple things. One, you have to worry about the cost uh, because once you start pelleting and processing the feed your cost is going to go way up but it certainly works well as a supplement. Again, if we, you have some poor quality hay, maybe some second or third year hay that's been stored and dried, you can use some pellets to, to beef that up. But the other problem that you have to feed worry about is the way that those horses eat them just like they would grain you eat just because it's a forage you have to introduce them slowly because if they start gobbling down big mouthfuls of pellets you can get some choke issues and things like that with them and so so that's something that you do want to you do want to take into consideration with that is introduce them slowly just like any change in feeding um, the hay cubes are another one um, and that one 
probably would have a little bit more of a problem with choke uh, if the horses aren't used to eating those, but cubes can certainly um, you know, be utilized as well as, as extending your hay without having to go to a grain and get that nutrient um, content up. It just depends on you know, your horses and, and what their needs are and how, you, how you're going to balance that, um, but certainly those, those things are good options to get into the, get into the diet now. In terms of, uh, here's another, another question related to hay cubes and quality and nutrition. Uh, one of the things that you should be getting if you're purchasing hay cubes or pellets, because those are a process feed, there are labeling requirements for those, just like your bag of feed uh, that you would buy if you buy a, an oat or a sweet feed. If that's bagged, there should be nutri nutrient analysis available with that. If not, you can send them in to be tested just like you would um, a regular hay bale, um, but you certainly need to, you know, try and gain that information to know what the makeup of that pellet was. If it's primarily an alfalfa base, you may have way more protein than what you need, and you have to take that into consideration uh, when you're when you're bal when you're balancing a diet. Um, for those horses, and so if the if the producer of those pellets doesn't give you the information, you would have to go get that yourselves. But typically, if you ask for it, they should be able to uh, to make that information available to you. Uh, back to the issue about opening a stack of hay um, before it's cured and molding. Let's see here. Let me finish reading it. Why is it? Um, the hay that, when hay is baled, again, uh, when, when we're baling up hay, it's typically going to have uh, 15, around 15% 15 moisture. And so that moisture in the hay, and there's a chemical process when that hay dries down, and so the, that hay is actually undergoing fermentation. And so when we're baling the hay, you put it in a stack, there is still moisture there, and even after it sits in the barn for a year, you're still going to have moisture in that hay. It's never going to be 100% dry. And so what has to happen is the chemical process that goes into that bale and to getting it to what we call cure, which is to where the chemical processes that are actually breaking down some of the protein structures and things in that hay actually average out, um, that process takes about two weeks. And once you get that hay into a stack, you want to leave it alone because you have anaerobic and aerobic bacteria that are working in there. And so what happens during that curing process is that you kill off the aerobic bacteria that are interior to that stack and the anaerobes sort of take over and they break down all the other proteins and chemicals that they're working on. And if you disrupt that process, that's when you can get some molds. The, whole, the hay wouldn't necessarily mold. It's not enough moisture to cause mold on its own. It's interrupting that process with oxygen in the middle of that fermentation process that causes the mold. It's not that the hay was too wet to put up to start with. If hay is too wet to put up to start with, you're going to get a lot of interior mold into the bales of those hay. Um, but this is what I'm talking about would be surface mold on the hay stack um, that, you're going to, that you're going to get at because when it's in the stack, uh, if you disrupt it, then the surfaces of those bales can mold and you can get some waste that way as well. Uh, next question is related to um, sedan grass and cyanide um, containing compounds that are in there. Um, one of the things that sedan grass you have to be really careful with, uh, especially under drought conditions, is that that's when you get the cyanide um, type compounds. You can get nitrate um, toxicity and things as well. And so the key with sedan grass is it has to be um, actively growing at over 18 inches tall uh, when it's harvested to be safe. And so certainly um, so, uh, sedan grass is something that we can use, but you have to use it cautiously, especially in a drought year. Um, and some testing might be in order to make sure that, that you um, are using that material safely. And, and a lot of questions need to be asked. And if it's an issue where you are looking at sourcing sedan grass um, type hay, then I would get some more information on that particular topic before you, um, before you went any further with it uh, and purchased that hay. Uh, let's see. 
terms of sending in hay cubes to getting them tested, uh, any lab in your area that, um, that does forage testing, a lot of land-grant universities do it. Um, here in Michigan, we have a private lab called, lab called Litchfield Analytical Services in Hillsdale County that does a lot of forage testing for producers around the state. Um, they can be found online. There's any place that you could send in a hay or feed sample for testing uh, would be would be a good place to do that and I can you can contact me and get some more information on that if you need it. Optimum protein uh, for the average horse. Uh, most of our horses at maintenance uh, you know, your, your geldings or your mares that aren't pregnant that are just kind of out around and you're doing some work with them, typically typical protein um, content that we're looking at feeding is going to be somewhere around um, 9 to 10 percent. Growing horses, lactating horses, those types of things, horses under high work um, loads, those horses are going to have higher protein requirements. But most horses, 9 or 10 percent protein is all you really need. They can convert some extra protein to energy, but most excess protein comes out in, in um, ammonia in the urine, which can add to environmental issues if you're in the barn with those horses. And so uh, you get more ammonia buildup in the urine if, if you're overfeeding protein greatly. Again, on the nitrates and grasses and drought areas, um, there's once you get a drought stressed problem in some of those grasses and you're going to have nitrate issues, there's really nothing that you can do to change the, the components of those hay other than grasses other than to get them growing again. And so the best thing to do is try and um, source hay from areas that haven't had that situation, hay that's actively growing. Um, can mitigate that issue. Sedan grass is one in particular that we really need to watch, but um, it can be an issue in drought drought years we really get into a problem because things start to get harvested that that may cause may be problematic and some different species are more sensitive than others and so you need to really uh, there's no way to mitigate it you just have to monitor for it and watch it and try and get um, you know try and get that under control the best that you can. Uh, let's see, back to the protein again. Uh, I think we got the how much is required and what should come from hay, what should come from grain. It can all come from hay. Uh, even poorer quality um, grass type hays are going to be 9, 10, 11, uh, maybe even up to 15 percent protein. And so you want to, um, you know, keep that in mind that you, you don't necessarily need the grain for protein. We're typically feeding grains uh, for energy excess energy. If the hay is lower in energy, lower in TDN um, content from balancing that ration, the horse is going to be energy deficient, especially in environmental extreme conditions like winters uh, for outside house horses, that type of thing. Um, then we use the grains to boost up the energy. But typically if you have decent quality hay and you've gone through those selection criteria that we talked about, um, then, then your hay is going to meet most of the nutritional needs uh, for your horses. Um, in terms of, let's see here, the grass fescue or the fescue grass hay, um, if they're used to those types of forages and you're sure that you've got the endophyte free varieties, there shouldn't be any problem with feeding that that hay to horses. Um, recognizing differences in grasses, that's a tougher question because once that hay is baled, it can be very difficult to identify individual grass species and I still struggle with that and I study it all the time. Um, there's some common ones. If the grass has gone to seed, which makes the palatability go down, you've got the seed head to work with, but if you're just looking at a, a vegetative grass, um, there are the USDA um, Grazing specialists have some very good bulletins and some online resources through the United States Department of Agriculture that you can look up some forage resources. There's some good pictures and different growth stages of those plants that you can try and get different leaf structures and leaf types and things to get a general idea of what type of grass, but really pinpointing what grasses are there without seeing it actively growing and in a lot of cases in in uh, seed stage is very difficult um, to determine sometimes. Um, 
not sure about the question dealing with carbs and, and fat percentage. Um, if you have something more in the and the beet pulp one as well, if you have some more information on that, I can try and address those. But it gets us a little outside of the the hay realm. Um, Uh, the question about feeding native grasses better than um, feeding native grasses better than orchard or fescues, uh, not really. I mean, it depends on you know what your horses are used to getting, but uh, it's not necessarily any better. Uh, it really depends on again looking at having that nutrient analysis and feeding your horses what they need. Uh, there's nothing wrong with native grass pastures and there, or hay fields, and there's nothing wrong with orchard and fescues either. Again, it gets back to uh, really getting at um, the needs of the horse. Uh, in terms of in terms of beet, feeding beet pulp, that's another uh, fiber supplement that you know that you can utilize. There's a lot of you know there's a lot of data available on it in terms of the benefits and things, and it is another option. Um, if beet pulp's available relatively inexpensively in your area, you can certainly use it as a hay replacement for a certain part of the diet. Um, it is a good you know fiber source that's available. It's a good nutrient content. You just want to make sure that you balance it um, in the rations that you're feeding. Uh, in terms of advice for, for hay growers, uh, managing and pricing, uh, basically this year hay should pretty much sell itself. Um, but the key is if you're really trying to target uh, horse owners in particular in the hay market, it's really looking at um, understanding the horse owner population. There are some large stables around that buy large quantities of hay, but there's also an awful lot of small stables that just need a little bit. And it's wor really working with people to understand what their needs are um, and trying to balance that with getting you know, a fair price and get your needs met as a hay grower, but also trying to make sure that you understand that population and that there's there's certain needs that they're going to they're going to request. But if you have a good quality hay, you've been selling it to horse owners, and the word gets out, um, the hay over time should basically sell itself, and you'll probably have a problem where you have uh, less hay than you have customers wanting it. So, uh, be happy to talk further um, at another time with with anybody that has questions about getting into the hay market. And that kind of things if you if you want to. Okay, the, the question on um, the question on the, the fats and carbohydrates was basically looking at um, feeding if the hay is nine to ten percent protein, what's the remaining ninety percent? What percentage should be fat and what percentage should be um, carbohydrates and and actually um, that question is a little, it's a little bit complicated to answer. We're really looking at balancing um, a total ration, and there isn't necessarily a percentage of fat or a percentage of carbohydrates. That part doesn't really matter. It's balancing um, the energy requirement uh, based on the needs of that horse and what workload they're in. And so what we try and do is do individual analysis for groups of horses, and I can't just give you a a percentage of energy that we need, which is what the fat and carbohydrate content is going to be. It's not just as simple as doing a just an energy um, percentage. You'd have to calculate that based on groups of horses and what their needs are. I just wanted to thank Matt for being our expert speaker tonight, and thank you to all of you for attending tonight's web presentation. Um, if you noticed on the slide, um, we do have a horse nutrition course now available through My Horse University, so if you're interested in that, please visit the website, myhorseuniversity.com. Also, we will have a web presentation in December. Um, as well in January and February. So if you want to check those out, please go visit the website. And if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to email info at myhorseuniversity.com. Thank you so much.